Hello, 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 beautiful, beautiful people. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever the time might be for you. Uh, today, we are going to examine entertainment in a new America. We've seen in previous lessons how this country has changed a tremendous amount. We've gone from a mostly rural country to uh, a very, very urbanized. We've gone from a country that derives its, its life from agriculture to a majority country that derives its life, or at least its uh, source of life, from wages, factory work, service industries. These changes are going to be reflected in the ways in which Americans choose to pass their time, the ways in which Americans choose to be entertained. Today, we are going to look at, at those changes and what we see, because in many ways, we're still living in the uh, late 19th century when it comes to how we choose to pass our time. This is all pre-internet, obviously, but still today, still today, there's so many things that we got from the late 1800s. We will look at popular culture during this time of change, leisure activities, and finally, professional sports. Popular culture, it's very difficult and very simple to define. What is popular culture? Well, number one, it's separate from high culture. High culture is the culture of the elites, the pastime of the elites, classical music, opera, uh, philosophy. Popular culture is for the masses for the average Joe or Jane, as it were. Popular culture, loosely defined, again, cultural activities or commercial products reflecting, suited to, or aimed at the tastes of the general masses. These tastes, these pastimes, these activities are going to undergo a tremendous, tremendous amount of change uh, during the Gilded Age. One way in which popular culture changes in the late 19th century is in art and literature. Art and literature with this movement that begins in France and comes to the United States by the late 18, mid 1800s. Realism, realism. What is realism when it comes to art and literature? It is the focus on the human experience, the human environment, average everyday surroundings, average everyday people. Literature and art are going to become more real, more raw, more exposed, and less romanticized. These changes will be seen in, in literature. Uh, men like Mark Twain, uh, Upton St. Clair, Jack London, they will be begin to write in a more realistic fashion. The language, the points of view will be told in a much more real way. But it's easier. It's easier to understand this shift. And this is all because of the Industrial Revolution and our urbanization. All of these changes. These changes are better explained uh, through painting. It's just easier, at least for me, to understand how these changes occur. And again, does art change society or does society change art? Well, both, both. But in the first half of the 1800s, the major movement within painting, at least in the United States and, and much of Europe, was romanticism. Now, romanticism isn't uh, two puppy dogs sharing spaghetti in an alley while Italian music's playing. Don't think romantic, romanticism. And what romanticism was, was a rejection of the earlier age of enlightenment. And so if the age of enlightenment was all about reason, thought, and science, romanticism was all about instinct, passion, emotion. And instead of focusing on humanity, the focus was on nature. And this was perfect for the first half of the 1800s in the United States because we still had a Wild West. We still had a vast, unknown uh, 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 jungle 
uh, towards the Pacific Ocean. And you can notice in these romantic paintings, the landscape is the focus. The landscape is always the focus. If there are humans in it, they are secondary. They are secondary. This was the first half of the 1800s, romanticism, the rejection of the enlightenment, the rejection of reason, of ration. But this is going to change. This is going to change as America and much of the West changes. By the late 1800s, the West has been declared closed by many people. It's no longer wild. Yeah, there's parts that are unsettled, but we've explored it, we've settled it. It's either a state or a territory. The new American landscape was the American city, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, and our art reflects this. And our art and literature turns towards realism. Realism showed the urban landscape and humans oftentimes were very much part of this landscape. This is the new natural environment of the average American with the concrete, the noise, the various languages from all over the world. This is the new America. We no longer watch th uh, uh, horses running along the uh, Rio Grande. We see two men boxing each other in a crowded stadium in Brooklyn. This is the new America. And it is undergoing so many changes that of course art would reflect this. Entertainment will change during the Gilded Age. In the late 19th century, the late 1800s, we see the rise of commercial entertainment. Up until the late 1800s, entertainment was oftentimes frowned upon in so-called polite society. Up until the late 1800s, we were a mostly rural, very Protestant, very religious country. And your free time was supposed to be spent in church, with family, with friends, um, do, doing charity work. There was, of course, commercial entertainment before the late 1800s, but in many circles, it was frowned upon. It was something that you might find in a saloon. It might be something that you would find in a club on the other side of the tracks, shall we say. But in the late 1800s, Americans in cities with free time and extra money want to be entertained. And they don't necessarily want to go to church. They don't necessarily want to join a fraternal order. And so individuals and companies arise to serve these American needs, new forms of entertainment. There is a shift. There is a shift in this country towards commercialized entertainment and the stigma attached to commercialized entertainment um, is lessened. No longer are they strictly associated with saloons, brothels, etc. It might even be a place where we can take the whole family. Why not? We're in the city. It's hot. Let's have some fun. It's Sunday. Let's not go to church. Let's go somewhere else. This, there's a, a cultural shift that occurs in the United States. One way in which the United States shifts culturally um, is in music. Now, up until the late 1800s, music was reserved, at least live music was reserved usually for the church. Um, it might be uh, reserved for the elite in opera. But in the 1800s, that begins to shift. Shows uh, uh, in, in England and New York, increasingly cater to the average Joe. Um, also in New York City, a large number of immigrants arriving bring their sounds, their uh, uh, cultures with them, changing American music. Men like Irving Berlin. Irving Berlin was a Jewish immigrant, um, and he will revolutionize the way in which Americans listen to music. Just him alone, just him alone. Um, he wrote over 2,500 songs. 25 of them were number one hits. Uh, some of Irvin Berlin's more popular songs um, are still classics today. White Christmas, uh, Putin on the Ritz, uh, God Bless America, There's No Business Like Show Business. I mean, these are quintessential American songs. Irving Berlin and many others begin working, writing sheet music 
to be sold. Now, this was a time before records. Records are coming. But sheet music, this sheet music would be sold uh, either privately to individuals or to uh, restaurants, saloons, where the house pianist could play it. So you're literally just selling the notes to music. But this is how uh, the music business first really began in the United States. And we're moving away from religious music. We're moving away from highbrow music. And we are moving towards a strictly American sound. For the first time, we're going to start producing music that we can honestly say is very much organically American. Irving Berlin and many others got their start in New York's famed Tin Pan Alley. This is where the music writers worked. And it got its name because as you walk the streets of this neighborhood in New York City, you would hear, you would hear the tin pans of, here one second, okay, making sure my mic's on here. <laughs> um, you would hear the, 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 the sounds of this music coming through the windows. Tin Pan Alley. One of the first superstars of American music in the late 1800s was Scott Joplin. Scott Joplin was a, uh, a, a, a pioneer in a new kind of music called ragtime. This is very much an American sound. Uh, he was a Black American, and this, this is really a, a form of Black music, but it's very much going to be adopted by white audiences as well. Scott Joplin will play to uh, all sections of American society, and it becomes the soundtrack of the late 1800s. I'm going to play a little bit for you. Hopefully it works. Um, when I think of the late 1800s, uh, it's, it's Scott Joplin. It is Scott Joplin. His biggest hit was, um, was uh, 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 The Entertainer, king of the ragtime. Let's see here. Will this work? I hope you heard that. I don't know. I don't know. I haven't run the experiment if it gets put over to the uh, uh, recording, but that is ragtime. Very much an American sound and and incredibly popular uh, throughout, especially the East. Not so much the Midwest or the South, but especially those Eastern cities. Let's see here. There we go. Thomas Edison is going to be developing the phonograph in the late 1800s. And by the time we get to the 1920s, we will have for the American consumption uh, record players. No more just sheet music is being sold. We are literally buying our records and playing them at home. A miracle of modern technologies. Jazz. More even than ragtime, jazz is a quintessentially American invention. And jazz will overtake ragtime in the early 1900s as the sound of cities, as the sound of cities. Now, in the countryside, you might have folk music, you might have, have bluegrass music, but in the cities, it's jazz. It is jazz. Let's see. Let's see if we can listen to just a little bit of jazz. I'm sure you know what jazz is. And again, you can hear ragtime in it, but it also has its own distinct uh, 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 syncopated beats. Um, a lot of improvisation goes on in jazz as well. Let's see. When the saints come marching in, now that is a later recording, um, and jazz won't become the sound of America uh, until the 1920s. In fact, it becomes the soundtrack of the 1920s, but jazz gets its start in New Orleans. New Orleans takes ragtime, and their musicians combine it with marching music, which has been popular in, in, in New Orleans for well over a century. Uh, hence the horns, the drums, everything. How did jazz music leave New Orleans and enter into northern music halls and take over an entire country? Well, first things first, New Orleans has always been known as a wild town. It has always been known, going back to the 1700s when the French had it, there are letters from French priests 
writing to the king saying this town is a hotbed of sin. They're pirates, prostitutes, runaway slaves, all doing the devil's work. And so New Orleans has always been a wild town, but that's not the story of jazz, but it's related to it. In the city of New Orleans, there was a certain section of town known as the Red Light District. I'm talking about Storyville. Storyville was where the brothels were. And in every brothel in New Orleans, you had a house musician who would entertain the guests, usually a pianist, but oftentimes uh, you would have some drums, horns, etc. The focus were the ladies of the evening. But all of these saloons, brothels, etc., had a house musician. How do these house musicians end up around the country? Well, during the First World War, the United States has a base right outside of New Orleans. But they have a problem. The United States has a problem. You see, the United States invests a lot in you when they make you a soldier or sailor. Many of these men, many of these men are getting venereal disease. Many of these men are getting venereal disease from Storyville. And so the U.S. government decides to shut down these brothels. They shut down these brothels. Black musicians from New Orleans, out of a job, begin traveling up north with other Black Americans who are going to the north for factory work because so many white men are going off to war in Europe during the First World War. Hundreds of thousands of factory jobs are opening up. This is known as the First Great Migration. We'll have another one during World War II. Black Americans leaving the South. Included in those Black Americans are jazz musicians who find work in New York, Detroit, Chicago. This is how jazz spreads from not just in the South now to places up North. And it becomes the soundtrack of an entire decade will get there. Just know Storyville has its place in this story. Vaudeville. If you've ever watched a variety show, the roots of this variety show can be found in vaudeville. What do I mean? Well, today, if you turn on the television and you watch a program that has dancers one minute, and then next you'll have maybe a child performer. Next, you'll have a, mu uh, a magician. They're all unrelated acts that take their turn on stage. You are watching the great, great grandchild of vaudeville. Vaudeville were traveling entertainment troops, traveling the country, presenting different entertainers. You would have vaudeville uh, shows catered towards various groups, various uh, uh, racial groups, immigrant classes, socioeconomic groups. But the thing they had in common was these were variety shows that toured. And how better to escape the drudgery of the factory, of the rail yard, of the coal mine. Then you go and see a magician, a child, in, a, 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 a child dancer. These young ladies, this is vaudeville. This is vaudeville. Traveling all around the country, entertaining the people. Early on, vaudeville was associated with, with drinking, gambling, other sins. But by the late 1800s, they've cleaned up their act a lot, so much so that even uh, women of Victorian society could take their kids and see a vaudeville show. And again, many of these vaudeville shows catered to the ethnicity of their particular audience. You had uh, Yiddish vaudevilles, Black American vaudeville troops, Italian, etc., all playing and all developing a distinct American sense of humor separating us even more from our European counterparts. Motion pictures. Vaudeville's end really comes with the rise of motion pictures. And I can't think of an industry more associated with the United States than motion pictures, uh, the cinema. Certainly other countries have 
fantastic films, but one nation has dominated this field for the last hundred plus years, and that is the United States. Now, in the early years, this, this new technology um, invented both in France and the United States at the same time was very, very basic. The early filmmakers of the late 1800s made the most, no longer than eight minutes. They were simply in love with the technology. And so you might go and sit and watch five minutes of a train going, uh, three minutes of a couple dancing. And at first you were just in love with that. That was why you came. But if cinema was going to move past that, uh, certain changes had to be made. Here's the great train robbery. One of the first blockbusters in this country. Go down to the Nickelodeon and for a nickel, you can go and be entertained. And the great thing about films is that you can show them in any room. You put up a white sheet on the wall and you can sit and make your own theater. And so from small towns to big cities, movies are introduced to the American public. And there's stories of people just sitting in awe. There is a great story about how in one film, all it was was a train coming at you. And by the time it got to where it was going to hit you, people literally, this is one of the first showings of a film, got up and ran to the side because they weren't quite sure of this new technology. By the 1920s, every town, great and small, had itself a movie house of some kind. Europe might have cathedrals, but American cities had these beautiful American celebrations of our culture. Now, Thomas Edison held the patent on the video camera used by American directors, and he was very, very tough and very, very greedy and made life very, very difficult for filmmakers in the early stages of cinema in this country. The film industry was actually based in New Jersey and New York, and Thomas Edison demanded high fees for the use of his patented equipment. Also, the film studios of New York and New Jersey were very greedy and they did not want to experiment. They were making their money off these short, simple films. Why ruin a good thing? And they didn't pay their stars and directors much. Oftentimes, they didn't even put the name of the actors or directors in the film because they didn't want them to get a big head and start wanting more money. And so a whole younger generation of directors and producers, men like D.W. Griffith, wanted more. They wanted to make longer movies. They wanted to tell more complex stories than simple train rides. And so this is where we get to the birth of Hollywood. This is where we get to the birth of Hollywood. In the early 1900s, certain renegade filmmakers move to a sleepy town outside of downtown Los Angeles called Hollywood, California, and they begin to make films there. Now, they're doing this illegally. They're using Edison's equipment or they're buying equipment from Europe and making new types of films, films with multiple angles, films with cutaway shots. Why do they choose Hollywood? Well, a number, it's the perfect storm. First of all, land is cheap. Land is cheap in Hollywood at this time. And there are plenty of barns uh, because this is farm country where we can shoot indoors and build sets. Furthermore, even more importantly, the geography, topography, climate of this part of California is perfect. You're within two hours of pretty much any background you want. You want to shoot in the forest? We have those. You want to shoot in the snow? We can get you there. You want to shoot in the desert? Don't worry about it. Oh, you need a beach scene? We have that too. All within no more than two hours. We can shoot year round too. When's the blizzard season? We don't have one. When's the rainy season? We don't have one. It's perfect. And more and more filmmakers begin moving to Hollywood in the early 1900s. It becomes the center of the film industry um, in this country. Men like D.W. Griffith can now make bigger, better, more modern films. Most people agree that the first modern film uh, was this film, The Birth of a Nation. The Birth of a Nation. The Birth of a Nation. The Birth of a Nation um, has a, a, a somewhat troubling 
history. It was based on The Klansman by Thomas Dixon, and it tells the story of the rise of the KKK in the American South. It was a giant hit. It was a giant hit, and it made Griffith a, a megastar. Um, the importance of this film outside of helping to cause the second wave of the KKK in the 1920s, which we'll get to, was it revolutionizes the film industry and it, it secures Hollywood's placement at the epicenter of this new industry. Here is Hollywood land in the 1940s. That sign was put up as a uh, land development deal. The land part later fell down and Everyone kind of agreed it looked better without it. We'll keep it that way. They were trying to develop that land, Hollywood land, those hills. Leisure activities. Leisure activities. By the late 1800s, we have more time. We have more money. Now, relative to now, nowhere compared. Nowhere compared. If anything, many of us have too much leisure time uh, in this modern society. Uh, our time, things to pretty much do what we want. Um, and that isn't necessarily a great thing. But in the late 1800s, early 1900s, this is fairly new in, in, in human history. I want to do what I want to do. I have the money and the time to do it. Leisure. Leisure. Time free from the demands of work or duty when one can rest enjoy hobbies, sports, etc. Because of this newfound leisure time, Americans begin to enjoy new leisure activities in this modern, modern world of ours. First things first, many of us simply want to escape the pollution, the noise, the crime, the crowded conditions of American cities. We yearn for what our grandfathers had. We yearn, we become romantics again. We yearn to be back with nature, to feel uh, dirt. Clean dirt, by the way, not something left by a horse cart. Uh, dirt under our toes, uh, the, the, the pure sun on our face. In the late 1800s, as part of a health craze, many Americans begin visiting the beach, begin swimming. And all across American cities, Baths are constructed. These are places where you can swim with relative peace. Uh, maybe you'll have a uh, music playing in the background. This is Sutro Baths in San Francisco, uh, out there by Sea Cliff. This is just one example of Americans, A, wanting to be entertained, B, wanting to be healthy and back with nature, and C, wanted to escape the filth and grit of American industrialization and urbanization. Here it is as it stands today. It, it did not survive the calamities of the 1900s, including an earthquake, but that is where Sutro Baths once stood, right there at Ocean Beach in San Francisco. What about if we don't want our kids playing uh, next to dead horses in filthy sewers? Well, American cities in the late 1800s, early 1900s, begin constructing playgrounds. Now, up until this point, Children played in trees, in rivers, uh, in valleys, hills. We don't have those in American cities. And so we see the beginnings of modern playgrounds. Little things you don't think about. This guy in the background, he's got air. He has got some air. My God. My God. How things are different. Look how high you could climb back then. <laughs> She's keeping her heels on. Very, very impressive. And you look at playgrounds today. You look at playgrounds today where you can't even have sand. You can't even have sand. And many kids are on leashes. Kids were sleeping on the, in boxes out of windows just 100 years ago. And now we have leashes. <laughs> now, if the kids are lucky, if the kids are lucky, they don't need to go to the party. The party will come to them. The circus. The circus, the modern circus is a child of the 1800s. 
And this was reserved just not not just for city kids, but now rural kids can have uh, amazing sights brought to them under the big top. This was always a big affair. They would unload the animals off of the train, use the animals to put up the tents. Absolutely fantastic. This is an age before people had uh, uh, photographs in books. This is an age, of course, before television. Many people were illiterate. You even, you've never even heard of a zebra, and now one is walking down your main thoroughfare. Absolutely mesmerizing. The greatest show on earth, ladies and gentlemen. Talk about entertainment. Ooh. <laughs> we also get the beginnings of the modern clown. I guess the great, 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 great grandchild of the medieval jester. Absolutely nothing creepy about these images, guys. Amusement parks. If you've ever been to an amusement park, just know that you are in fine company because these were born in your great, great, great grandfather's and grandmother's time. Amusement parks. Amusement parks really get their start with rail companies. Rail companies, especially in cities, noticed that on the weekend, no one rode their rails because no one had to commute to work, especially in big cities like New York. And so what they started doing was at the end of these rail lines, the very last stop, well, on the outskirts of these cities, they put attractions. There might be a petting zoo. There might be a playground. Then they start putting rides. They start putting rides to attract people. Take the train. Oftentimes it's free. Pay for a ticket for you and your family. Go out. Visit nature and all of its finery. This is the beginning of the amusement parks in this country. Trying to get people to ride the rail, to ride the rail to the far-flung ends of these metro lines. The first amusement park in this country was Coney Island. Coney Island out in Brooklyn. It's the very end of the line. By 1875, a million passengers rode the Coney Island Railway. Many of them on the weekend ended up at the Coney Island amusement parks. Now, there wasn't one. There wasn't one. There were many. There were many. The first was Sea Lion Park, um, but they were. there will be more. There will be more. Uh, by 1910, attendance on a Sunday could reach a million people at Coney Island. In the early days, come out. Enjoy the water, get some fresh air. More and more people begin coming out to Coney Island. In one part, for the water. But for the other part, to ride these rides, to see these exotic animals. Coney Island develops into a very, very uh, modern, complex, absolutely entertaining destination. Gentlemen, kindly sit on the left side of the uh, boat. That's because that's what's going to get wet. Let your ladies stay dry, gentlemen. Edison, supplying the electricity. He's everywhere during this era. It's to be entertained. It's to escape the drudgery of everyday life. This is why people continue to go to amusement parks. You can visit the world in just a few city blocks. Listen to music, drink, laugh. Luna Park. See horses jump into the waters below. See things you would never normally see. Not only were the animals on display, but so were people. So were people. And so this is how people 
again, were entertained during their leisure time. It was at Coney Island that we had the first Miss America contests. Now, what if you're on the West Coast? What if you are on the West Coast? Well, we have Santa Cruz Boardwalk, the Coney Island of the West. Santa Cruz developed um, as an escape for people living in San Francisco. They came out to Santa Cruz on the rail lines to enjoy the hot baths, the, the ocean air, etc. But just like Coney Island, different developers, different developers started building attractions. Which turned into the famed boardwalk. Santa Cruz, Coney Island, Coney Island were just one of many. I think by 1910, we had between 1,500 and 2,000 amusement parks across the country. What really killed the amusement park was the popularity of the car because people were now not slaves to train travel and could go anywhere. And so with the rise of the automobile, we saw many hundreds of amusement parks go out of, go away. Um, some, of course, still remain. Cycling, cycling, cycling emerges in the late 1800s uh, as a way to get out of the city, as a way to breathe. Now, after very, a great many different experiments with various designs, the bicycle, as it was referred to. Here's a pretty interesting design. I'm sure you could buy one of those on eBay right now. They settled on um, what we recognize today as a bicycle. I have a bike that isn't that different, uh, to be honest. Um, but again, we're getting people out into the countryside, into municipal parks, uh, breathing healthy air. It also helps to change the way we view uh, women and women view themselves. You can't ride a Victorian or Edwardian, you can't ride in a Victorian or Edwardian dress, those hundreds of acres, hundreds of acres, uh, hundreds of yards of, of fabric. And so for the first time, my God, we see women in trousers. What? 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 This helps to usher in a different way of viewing women and a different way of women viewing themselves. It's one small part of what will be uh, known as the women's rights movement. We'll get there. We will get there. But just one little cog, one little wrench in the machine. Finally, professional sports. If this weekend you sit down to enjoy a basketball game, a baseball game, a football game, maybe a, 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 a boxing match, just know that what you're watching really are products of the 19th century. Up until the late 1800s, how did uh, mostly men find entertainment in taverns and other institutions of ill repute? Well, men watched uh, a, a, a cockfighting, was very, very popular. Another blood sport was dogfighting. Very, very popular. This is 1700s, early 1800s. Uh, bull baiting, where a bull was chained to a stake and dogs were used to try to bring down the dog, uh, the bull, and you would bet on this. Or you might simply watch a, a dog see and bet on how many rats he can eat or kill. Over the 1800s, these sports are increasingly demonized, criminalized, and pushed underground. They never entirely go away. Many of these sports are still around, um, but they are pushed underground. And mostly men want a replacement for these blood sports. There's something in us that likes to see these sorts of things, uh, whether it's good or bad. That's none of my business uh, in this context. But there's something there. And so these sports emerge to replace those previous blood sports, things like pugilism. Pugilism has been around since ancient times, boxing. Two men fighting it out to the amusement and entertainment of their audience. Certainly, I'm not saying that pugilism isn't invented in the 1800s, but what we recognize as boxing pugilism uh, does. It certainly does. It becomes more and more popular 
uh, in the 1700s in England, by the 1800s, pugilism comes to this country. Uh, in let me get the right year for you guys, because I know it's so very important. In 1866, the Marquis of Queensbury uh, gave his support to a new set of rules, which helped to so-called civilize the game. Um, it introduced the Queensbury rules, introduced a three-minute round. It eliminated eye gouging, wrestling, um, and it will make the use of gloves mandatory. It also introduced a 10 count, um, a, 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 a 10 second count as well, as far as victory goes. By the late 1800s, bare knuckle boxing is over. Uh, but Americans fall in love with boxing in cities and in the countryside. Also, interestingly enough, this is a way for a poor man to die a rich man, especially popular within immigrant groups. You might come here with no money, no education, but you're going to work hard and develop one hell of a right hook. Well, then you can become famous. You can become like John Sullivan. The man was a superstar. But as soon as they forced him into gloves, he was no longer uh, a force to be reckoned with. His magic was in his bare fists. He went 75 rounds with Kilrain. 75 rounds. My God. My God. Baseball, often recognized or celebrated as America's sport. Baseball develops in the late 1800s. Um, it comes from the English game of rounders and cricket, but it certainly, certainly uh, develops into its own sport. Baseball played in parks, shipyards across the country. In 1876, the National League was formed. It becomes professional. In 1903, in 1903, the National League and its rival, the American League, played the first World Series. Baseball, like many, many, uh, uh, well, all professional sports, will remain uh, segregated into the 1940s. Football. Football comes from uh, the English game of rugby, but again, develops into its very much its own separate beast. Football begins on college campuses, played by elites, but it becomes professionalized by the early 1900s. This was a tough, tough game. No pads, no pads. Uh, in 1905, 18 players were killed by injuries related to American football. By the 1920s, it is fully professional. I love these old images. Finally, basketball, invented in 1891 in Springfield, Massachusetts, by this man, James Naismith, a YMC instructor, YMCA, pardon me. He wanted a, a sport that his players could play uh, year-round, indoors. And so he literally gets a basket, puts it on the wall, basketball. Basketball will be segregated until 1950. Now, in our next lesson, we are going to examine how the United States in the late 1800s sought to expand its borders. From sea to shining sea didn't seem like enough. And so American big business and American government officials begin to look overseas. We begin to look for an empire. 
How did the Americans acquire an empire? We will look at that next time. Beautiful people. Thank you very, very, very much. Until next time.